Okay, so this um, is a male, 75 years old. He presented in October of this year with pancreatitis associated with jaundice and a pseudocyst. And the CD performed um, in October showed dilated bilateral intrahepatic ducts and CBD down to the level at the pancreatic head. There was no pancreatic head mass and there was no gallstone. Um, also noted multiple thin wall cystic lesions at the left upper abdomen and peripancreatic regions with the two dominant cyst measures about 9.5 centimeters and 7.8 centimeters, which compressed onto the posterior wall of the stomach. ERCP was performed the next day, um, which found a two centimeter distal CBD stricture and a um, double pigtail was inserted. The pseudocyst was then aspirated um, later um, in November with 1.2 liters of brownish cyst fluid aspirated, so the cyst collapsed, and the cyst content CA was low. So this is the initial cyst um, with the dilated intrapatic ducts. Um, then the um, other cyst was then drained fire at US guided and an axial stent was inserted. Um, US was then uh, performed uh, last week and it showed a 3.8 and 4 by 4.0 centimeter pseudocyst at the pancreatic body and neck region, which does not communicate with the stent. The PD was grossly dilated with a potential communication with another one centimeter collection at the pancreatic body. Biopsy was taken of the pseudocyst wall and the stent was removed. Um, this is the picture of the US and showing the cyst. And so today we'll be doing an ERCP with a PD stenting and a pseudocyst drainage for this patient. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Uzma Siddiqui, and then we have Dr. Tang here uh, joining me, and also their pancreatic biliary surgeon, Dr. Fung. Very nice consultative service here uh, at Prince of Wales. Uh, so this case, you know, as you, as you already heard, a little bit uh, complicated in terms of the fact they already drained one collection and removed the axios, and then he still has persistence of another collection. Uh, I think in this day and age with a lot of EUS guided drainage of pancreatic fluid collections, we tend to, we have moved a little bit away from doing uh, pancreatic duct stenting. So in my practice as yours, we also do drain the collection first, see how the patient responds, and then we do PD stenting if they have recurrent collections uh, as needed, which I agree in this case it, prob it might be worthwhile uh, doing it as well. Usma, before you start, yes. uh, this patient has a pancreatic duct which is dilated, has got a recurrent uh, cyst, has also got a CBD stricture. So taking all this into view and that you have a pancre hepato pancreatic biliary surgeon <laughs> behind you, yeah. don't you think that should be a better option rather than pancreatic stenting which is going to be very temporary? Okay, so, yeah, that's, that's true. Right. Oh, surgery, I mean. Uh, thank you for the comment on this uh, case. Uh, we know that this patient is actually a, um, a poor pre-morbid state, so uh, we want to conf um, discuss amongst the experts about the management yeah. of this case, whether we should consider operative resection, basically a Whipple's, uh, obviously with uh, many comorbidities, uh, uh, morbidity uh, uh, for this case. So basically we want uh, our ex uh, the experts here to uh, discuss uh, whether we should proceed to Whipple's or whether yeah. we should uh, so do we proceed to endoscopic a, a treatment. A very enlightened audience here, so we'll ask them then, take <laughs> a democratic view. If this patient was nutritionally all right, how many would how go for surgery? Nobody, because in endoscopy That's conference, how many for endoscopy? Okay. More for endoscopy, okay, oh, the endoscopy. Nag Nagi, I'm a surgeon and I'm, I'm go I will go for endoscopy. Okay. I mean, because endoscopy is been. Obviously, the discussion has been had with the surgeon, and um, I agree with you, Nagi, given the fact that there's so many uh, ongoing issues uh, and questioning how long all of our endoscopic therapies are going to work. But if the patient's not deemed a surgical candidate, then we're kind of left with uh, what can we accomplish with the endoscopy. So we've decided to pursue endoscopic <laughs> therapy. Oh. Uh, so I was asked to drain the additional collection that's, de that's developed. It's gotten a little bit bigger since the last time they did an EUS. I think you can see the, the image on the screen right now. In the past, it was about four centimeters, and now it's about six centimeters. And when we drain these pseudocysts, 
And well, my plan was to drain the pseudocyst uh, via EOS first, and then do the ERCP and inject the, the pancreas duct at that point uh, with the stenting. Typically, when we drain these with EUS, we have a couple different options in terms of the types of stents we use, especially when it is a simple uh, fluid-filled pseudocyst. And our options are to just leave pigtail stents, or we can use lumen-opposing metal stents. Uh, and that was the discussion we were having. In our unit, we tend to air, use the lumen-opposing metal stents more often, just for the fact that you have less exchanges of equipment, it's a much simpler procedure, um, but the main downside is it's very, very expensive. Our lumen opposing metal stents cost 5,000 US dollars uh, versus pigtail stents only cost about $50. So, uh, and realistically, probably that's enough. There's no data that shows the lumen opposing metal stents are better for a simple pseudocyst drainage. Yeah. Uh -huh. May I request if you can demonstrate any main duct yes. communication? to the pancreatic cysts, please? I think on EUS that might be a little bit harder to demonstrate. You can see here, we have the pancreas in the body area, and here's the PD. I don't know how. Which does not appear to be dilated in the body. Nagi, it's actually, the PD is not dilated upstream. But this was an MRCP report earlier about yeah. the dilated. A little bit dilated maybe in the mm -hmm. neck area, yeah. but so not much. Uh, There's not yeah, much dilation uh, at all Okay. at this point. And then there is a little fluid collection just adjacent to the body right there. Yeah. That may be uh, from residual the from the residual, first one. Yeah. How long was the Axio stent mm. in place before? Uh, for at least a month, and then okay. uh, it was pulled on Friday. He does have an atrophied gland. When you, right now, the pancreas body parenchyma is in your view. I don't know if there's an arrow on this. Can you get a longitudinal view of the pancreatic duct? Possible? A longitudinal. Can you see it there? Yeah. That and then we're following. <laughs> He, does, he has an atrophy gland, so there's really not much yeah. it, tail at all. In fact, because you can see right below, there's the kidney, left kidney. Yeah. And there's really no pancreas. And he also has a couple calcifications in the parenchyma as well. Okay. The EDI this is what has been mm -hmm. our experience, that if we find parenchymal classification For and chronic. biliary obstruction, mm -hmm. then these patients uh, will almost always require at some stage surgery. I mean when they're better nutritionally and so on. Mm -hmm. No, I agree with you. I mean, he definitely has findings of chronic pancreatitis that are significant. But right. So uh, the interesting thing about the case was originally uh, when the patient presented with obstructive jaundice, we were uh, actually uh, concerned that, okay, is this a case of a pancreatic head mass or something else? But then... Uh, well, I think throughout the course, uh, with repeated imaging in US, uh, we cannot identify uh, an obvious mass. And um, and after the drainage of the first fluid collection and um, the uh, fluid analysis and also uh, the observation of the mucosa through the axial stent uh, is not suggestive of a uh, uh, mucinous tumor. And we also took biopsy, but uh, it hasn't come back. But uh, overall, the appearance of the uh, tissue uh, seen through the stent looks more like uh, the type of tissue you see from uh, drained pseudocyst. So. Well, I think the discussion is just long-term for surgery. Yes. Right. Um, I think at this point, though, we've decided we're going to pursue endoscopic therapy and see how the patient does. So now the question is just what are we going to drain Raymond. the suit? Uh, Raymond, do we have the levels of CA 99? Ah, okay. Uh, did you have the tumor marker level? They did have a CEA that the, the CA was... Not the, the serum it's CA it's normal. It's normal. normal. It's okay. Yeah. okay. So what's your plan, Usman, now? What type of stent you decided? We were debating, we, I would prefer doing a hot axios, but we could do a, a pigtail stent. Again, um, my preference would be a plastic because... Pigtail, because it's just fluid. Yeah. So again, last the audience, how many want plastic? <laughs> how many want hot axis? Oh, 
So most people don't want anything then, because <laughs> the choice is between the only two people who want our taxes <laughs> and <laughs> others don't want <laughs> plastic. So I don't know. Okay. Or maybe it's too early in the morning. <laughs> 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 Well, we could, we'll go with the plastic then. We'll just review a little bit how I approach the pseudocyst drainage in general. You know, typically you want to try to make sure that your scope is in a straight position. If you're doing, the other th issue when you're doing plastic pigtail stents versus hot axios, you definitely, you don't have to, but in the majority of cases, you definitely, you need to have fluoroscopy as opposed to hot axios can be done completely under EUS guidance. But I try to look on fluoroscopy. I don't know if you have that view. And just make sure my scope is in a straight position. Also, I take note how far I am from the G junction and because I don't like to place unnecessary stents through the distal esophagus. Um, but in this case, we're well below the G junction at about 55 centimeters. Uh, and then I also just take a look endoscopically. And, and then... This is a very important point for the audience that you very often you tend to, without, if you don't do this, you tend to put the stent into the esophagus. Right. You tend to underestimate how deep you are in with the U.S. and I think this is important. No, definitely. So I always try to check all of those issues first, then we check for any blood vessels. And then also you want to make sure that whatever you're going to be draining uh, through the GI tract wall is, is close to the GI tract wall because the farther away it is, the more likelihood you may push away or end up with your stents uh, in the peritoneum. So there doesn't, we ca definitely have some windows where there's no blood vessels. And then we just want to measure to the... Okay, Uzma, as you're doing this, we'll go over to Noria because he's ready and we'll perfect. start and then we'll come back. Okay, to you. perfect. By Thank you. Ready with everything. Okay. okay. All right. So. We decided to go with, uh, now that we, the first decision was deciding with our surgeon, the patient's not necessarily a good surgical candidate at this time, so we are pursuing endoscopic therapy. The second issue was we're going to drain this collection, hot axios versus pigtails. Everyone agreed pigtails is probably reasonable. So with the 19 gauge needle, again, sometimes you have to adjust your tip of the scope. We actually now have a, a Boston Scientific 19-gauge uh, FNA needle. And then I always sharpen the tip by pulling back the stylet a little bit so that you have full sharpness of your, of your needle. And then we'll go in. So that's usually how it works. Right. And then nice. we're going to pull the stylet out. Can you zoom in and see the fluid here? Yeah. It's interesting because this clear. fluid looks huh? clear white. Yeah. It does not look like a pseudocyst. I don't know if you can see that. Any risk? Yeah. This is uh, mucinous? Mm? It's very clear. Mm. I can't hear very it. Clear. Nagi, oh. hello? Yeah, it's very clear. We can see it yeah. is very clear. So now I'm wondering. Yeah, what do you think, Nagi? Like, what do you think? It looks like coconut water. Ah. <laughs> Should we test the string sign? <laughs> we could do that. Yeah, okay. That's, uh, we're going to we're gonna test the string sign to see its viscosity. So I think that good addition now for plastic stents. This is the reason why. No, it is true. I, a lot of times, though, you can get full depending, depending on the patient's history. And obviously, for any pseudocyst, to assume someone has a pseudocyst, you need to make sure they did have a significant episode of pancreatitis before. The string sign is there? Or? I don't know. It looks... It looks not that Do again? No, it's pretty watery. No, 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 yeah. No, 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 yeah. That's a, that was the string sign. You just try to see if it's <laughs> viscous yeah. at all. Yeah. So pretty, pretty uh, non-viscous? Correct. So with chronic pancreatitis, this is sometimes what we get with a pseudocyst. Sometimes very clear fluid, a very little debris. That's the one downside, though, with the, the lumen opposing center, the hot axios. It doesn't have a suction port. So you better be sure of the diagnosis before you place that stent. So I would never put it in someone if I wasn't 100% sure. But, and also I but think this is an indication that is communicating with the duct. When you get such correct. clear fluid, yeah. it's an indication it's communicating with the duct. But it, it is always helpful sometimes to look at the fluid up front. And then they are going to send it for CEA and amylase. We're passing our 025 guide wire now. Contrast sometimes or? I usually no. don't. 
because I try not to, yeah, to add more fluid. And then I try to just loop up my wire a couple times if possible. Again, the one benefit with our lumen opposing stents, you don't have to use fluoro, you don't have to exchange equipment. So now I'm just gonna, before I pull my needle out, now that I, I don't know if you see all the fluoro, we've looped up the wire a couple times. First, I'm gonna try to just dilate the wall with just the sheath. Hold on one second. The other thing I think very important for the audience to notice that Usma is holding a scope absolutely still. There's very little, because if you, even with little movement, sometimes you lose the access uh, at this stage. It's already shrinking down though, but. Yeah, it's shrinking. <laughs> Let's see. So we'll try to see if we can get through without using cautery. I'm just going to give myself a little more room. So you're trying to push the sheath now. Yep. Sometimes it works. In this case, it didn't. So I think it's chronic pancreatitis, so you may have some. Yeah, so we're going to go ahead and pull our needle back. Okay, so exchange. And we're going to exchange out. Okay. And how many loops of the wire would you put in? Lots and lots or just? Usually I do about two. You were commenting because one of them f fell back. <laughs> 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 and then we're going to go ahead and we'll exchange out. Okay, and then we'll go with our cystotome. There's different devices you can use. Again, cystotome, needle knives. I prefer you the cystotome. Balloon dilate it now. You would put a cystotome and then balloon dilate. Yes, because the balloon probably won't go through at this point. Yeah. Again, because as you mentioned, the chronic pancreatitis, the very thick wall, it's probably going to be very difficult to get through. So we're just... Then there's also uh, different types of catheters. A 10 French cystotome, you can put multiple wires in. Yeah. Uh, a Haber ramp catheter, you can also put multiple wires down at once. Uh, but so those are... Going to, you're going to use a 10 French or a 6? No, I'm going to use the 6. The other devices are a little bit more cumbersome. And also, we don't have the six in the U.S., so I, I take advantage of it when I can. <laughs> so the learning curve starts. So we're coming with the six French cystotome. And again, opposed to the needle knife, you have a little bit more circumferential uh, cutting surface. That's the, the plan. Then the question uh, becomes, what do you want to, how big do you want to dilate to? Um, yeah. I usually do between eight and ten if I'm going to put multiple pigtails in. You have the wire? Okay. A little bit of tension. So you're using cutting current? It is on cutting current. I was told this is... We might have to up it. It is very thick though, for sure. Yeah. We're having a... Yeah, you got it? Okay, perfect. All right. Hold on. It is. Yeah, and so the other thing you saw in fluoro, you don't want to see your, your catheter bending because then you might have a chance of pushing away or, um, again, not going through the cavity, the, into the collection. The important thing probably is to press on the cautery even before you start yep. pushing. Yep, we were doing it, okay. but... Just we're changing, we're upping the current here. All right, so, so our next option is we are going to up the current. How much is the current on now, Raymond? Uh, it's on uh, one We increased from 100 watts to 120. 120, oh, yes. that's right. So AutoCut Effect 5, 120 watts. Okay, you're going to give a little bit of tension? Okay. So Rob, you have any suggestions? <coughs> we'll, tr we'll get it. Or we could switch to a little bit larger, or we could try a needle knife. Or switch to hot axios. <laughs> <laughs> Again, because it obviates the need for having to get through this really tough wall. Of the down there, eh? no. We're trying to hold a little tension. And I'm just trying to change the position a little bit to try to kind of tip into the collection. We're pretty straight, though, but I'm going to have yeah, you yeah, give tension as now. I go. Very straight, mm. yeah. Okay. Oh, great. Oh, I think we got Wonderful. it. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. That was just, I think it would help just to kind of lean into it a little bit more with the scope. So, yes. okay. So now we can, we'll go ahead and exchange out and then we're going to go with our dilating balloon. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, perfect. So she, my assistant's giving me, hold on one second, tension. And then I just want to move back just enough so I can see the tip of the dilating balloon. Without changing my angle too much. We can go ahead and dilate. And can we see the floor? Do you have the floor of you also? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we have a little contrast in the balloon. We should see a waist. Go ahead. You're pulling back the balloon. Yeah, coming up the waist is there. Yep. Uh, yeah, very nice, very nice. Yeah, see the waist in you, very nice. Uh, Going. You can tell how thick this wall is, though. Because it's still taking, ah. oh, now we got it. Yes. Okay, because it took a while to actually yeah. get it to full dilation. Yes. Okay, we'll go ahead. Eight millimeter? Eight yes, millimeter. eight millimeter. Yeah. Okay, and then I think we will put that loop, loop yeah. wire. Okay. Which I have not used that one before, but obviously having multiple wires in at once is great. Now, the one thing you have to make sure you have a therapeutic EUS scope. Um, if you're going to have multiple wires and multiple stents. And if you have two wires in the scope, you can only put a seven French stent first uh, and then go from there. Go ahead, exchange. Okay. Let's so, exchange. Uh, so the oh, balloon down, yeah, sorry. Balloon down. Balloon down. Okay, okay. Yeah, deflate. Sorry, I thought you were doing that. Yeah, I think seven, seven French double pigtail. And what length would you use seven? I usually use short stents, either anywhere from three to five centimeters. We have a three here. Yeah. So All right. On to you. Hi. We, hello. We got in the first stent, and now we're just putting in uh, our second stent. So, this is seven so French, uh, five uh, centimeter, or three centimeter. Three centimeter. I did three. three so these are seven okay. French three centimeter stents. Yes. Um, so Usu, can you give us some hints on how to recandidate? Because sometimes we, we have trouble with this. Usually. I just try to, well, depending on what device you use, you could either recannulate uh, with the, the stent pushing catheter or a sphincter tome or just a regular cannula tome uh, or just a uh, cannula. But so I just go right on top of my old stent okay. and then advance the wire mm -hmm. from there. And usually, if it goes easy, you're, you should be within your cavity again. Some people also uh, inject more contrast. As long as everything looks similar to the first wire passage, uh, I don't usually. And Nagi, they did not have the loop wire. Loop wire okay. See, because I think one of the things is about the false track that you have to be careful about. Correct, yeah. yeah. That's, that's the most important thing. In yeah. this particular case, because it was so uh, tough to get through the first time, um, yeah. I knew that if the, the catheter easily went through into the collection, we should still be uh, in a good spot. But uh, that Ishma, can you tell us uh, how we are going to do stenting, how it's different from ERCP because this is a totally different. Uh, stenting for the, the yeah, placement uh, of the stent. Going, yeah, how we are going to put the stent in the steps, the finest steps of uh, this. Correct. So we're past for the seven French stent. These are Boston Scientific stents. So there are the distal pig has a marking uh, just before the, the pigtail forms. If you use cook stents, which is what we tend to use in the States or what I use, uh, you have to make the mark yourself, uh, but you should definitely be aware of uh, how the stent is marked because with pigtails, you could put the entire stent into the collection. So once we pass it, you can see the second stent right now uh, endoscopically. I try to get a very straight, close position so that I don't push away as I uh, push the stent you into elevator, the collection. elevator on this? Yes, the, uh, the elevator is open currently. It was, I keep it down until the stent gets to the elevator, similar to ERCP in that respect, and then go ahead and open it and put in the stent. Again, e whether you can get separation with the wire and tome passage, you could also get separation with your stent passage. So everything should go very smoothly and easily along the same kind of contours as your original uh, stent. And also, you just want to make sure your scope does not push away at all as you're de deploying your stent. But it's going pretty easily. 
maintain the wire, obviously. And now what I'm doing endoscopically, I'm just looking for that, sec that pigtail. Yeah. So I'm pushing, elevator's open. I'm kind of tipped down a little bit, and I'm, I'm use my big knob to look away just a little so that I can easily see the mark that you see on the screen right now. So now that I've seen my pigtail mark, my goal is to just give my stent enough room to deploy into the stomach. So I push back the scope a little bit. Yeah, I think this is a very important point. So you just come back with the scope a little bit and as then you're maintaining the pressure. Yeah. While you, but yeah, and then you also have to kind of tip down a little to let the stent come out of your scope. And then now she'll release everything. You could. Yeah, very nice. But the yeah. key thing with pigtails, you just don't want to push them all the way into the collection mm -hmm. and push, pulling back the scope a little while you push the stent out a little because you still want to maintain the position that you have. Mm -hmm. But okay, first part is done. Yes. And now we'll tackle the ERCP part. Usma, that was a fantastic demonstration. And I'm just trying to suction yeah, all the fluid very quickly. All right. Yeah.